was given this assignment, I think, because I'm the only one with a BHR tie. So they allowed me to uh, give the keynote. <clears throat> so um, I titled my talk BHR 2020. So we have now 20 years past, and hopefully we're going to have 20 years into the future. So this is just my chance to give some thoughts on resurfacing. Uh, we talked, Tim gave a very nice overview. It's not a new concept. Uh, started with the metal on poly in the 70s with Amstutz, Wagner, and Freeman. Uh, they had some early failures. This is a paper actually by Dr. Salvati from my institution that he did some resurfacings and they found that uh, there was a very early failure rate due to femoral neck fracture as well as acetabular loosening. And he said, we should have a caution towards surface replacement um, because of this early failure rate. So every time I see him in the hallway, he says, are you still doing resurfacing? Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think today's resurfacing is definitely different. Um, it has a different heritage based on the metal on metal resurfacing and re ring pros excuse me, Wagner and ring prostheses. Uh, it looks a little different because it has the short stem for accurate positioning on the femur. We're cementing the femur and press fitting the acetabulum. And here's Derek and Ronan receiving their honorary degrees from Birmingham in 2006. I think three major changes happened with this modern generation that helped us get it right. Uh, one is the implant materials and design. Uh, two is impl improved instrumentation. Three is improved surgical technique. And Peter mentioned, I think, very similar things. And that gave uh, some midterm results here in this uh, paper from the UK, eight-year results at 97% comparing both lateral and posterior lateral approaches. There was a lot of excitement with the resurfacing when it first came on the scene. This is an article that called it the everlasting hip or the sporting hip. Um, I think it may have led to some irrational exuberance at some point where people were putting them in all sorts of patients. These are a couple uh, patients that I don't think any of the surgeons in this room today would tackle with resurfacing. And these were dysplastic patients using the dysplasia cup. Uh, we went through an era where everybody thought resurfacing was the, was the wave of the future and came out with these Me Too devices from 2002 onward. But as we've seen, they've really all exited the market either through recalls or withdrawals and high incidence of problems. And I like to think, uh, just like Highlander, there can be only one and that is Derek McMinn saying that there can be only one device, and that's why the BHR is standing alone. The reality of the metal-on-metal -metal bearing has taught us a lot of lessons over time. We've learned that hard-on-hard -hard bearings depend on hydrodynamic lubrication, and there's importance of clearance. We have to pay attention to acetabular clamping. We have to pay more attention to malpositioning of the components, and now we know that acetabular malpositioning can lead to edge loading, loss of that fluid film lubrication. It's probably contributed to by excessive inclination and antiversion on the socket side, smaller sizes, and probably female gender because of <coughs> laxity and hypermobility. Uh, there has been an era of media attention from the New York Times. So those of you uh, may remember going through a series of articles with what seemed like every week something about metal on metal, total hip replacement and resurfacing, and none of them were favorable, unfortunately. Uh, there were worldwide media um, <clears throat> announcements, such as from the MHRA in the UK, which is basically like their FDA, announcing an advisory to follow up their metal and metal hips, giving some recommendations about metal ion levels, and also advising yearly surveillance for these um, metal and metal joints. Scientific articles in our literature in 2011, 2012, I think, were the high point looking at these issues, uh, such as pseudotumors, um, looking at metal ion levels, looking at soft tissue problems, around these joints, accelerating failures of certain models of hip resurfacings and replacements. So we did learn a lot going through that era, and thankfully we've, I think, weathered the storm. We learned things about hip resurfacing, that the larger head size did not mean that you could position your cup indiscriminately. At first you thought you could put the cup anywhere because the size was so big you wouldn't have to worry about instability. 
we learned that cup position is the most important technical factor for implant survival. So that's what I always emphasize to the residents and fellows. It's not really about the head position, it's all about the cup position. Uh, we also learned through this era that not all implants are equal. You have to pay attention to the arc of coverage and how the implant was designed. And we've also learned that metal ion monitoring can be useful, and we're gonna talk about that through tomorrow's session. We also learned things from our experience with the metal on metal hip resurfacings about hip arthroplasty in general. We've developed imaging techniques such as Maverick MRI, which was basically designed to look at metal on metal joints and allowed us to get a clearer picture of the soft tissues around these joints. We did learn through our experience in measuring metal levels about the importance of mechanically assisted crevice corrosion, and it really brought to the forefront, again, I think, trunnionosis uh, in a total hip replacement because of our attention to these metal and metal problems. So where are we now? Well, I think that hip resurfacing is at a mature stage, and uh, this is a slide uh, provided by Derek um, about his first patient with 20-year x-ray results looking very steady without changes from his first post-op year after surgery. We know that hip resurfacing at one point was very popular. It was the fastest growing operation. And uh, now in most areas of the world, it's less than 1% of total hip arthroplasty. Fortunately, I think it seems to have stabilized. And that's why I'm so excited to get together and see all of you here excited about resurfacing. Uh, some internal data from Smith & Nephew shows that they're is slow incremental growth of resurfacing in parts of the world. Uh, this is a slide from Derek, which he shared with me at um, ISTA in Seoul, Korea. This is his series of patients, so uh, looking at over 1,600 patients at 15 years and continuing their Kaplan-Meier survivor to 20 years, it was 97% survivorship at 20 years for diagnoses uh, other than DDH or AVN. <clears throat> in looking at men versus women, at uh, 20 years, his results in males are 97.9% survival, and in women, 94.7% survival. So both uh, doing quite well at 20 years. In looking at gender, uh, he emphasized that his best performing group actually are women under the age of 50. So uh, women under the age of 50 at 20 years had 99% survival. Men in both age groups did very well with under age 50, 98%, and uh, over 50, 97.7%. So very stellar results as you would expect from Derek. The major benefit I think in this day and age to my patients is activity and bone preservation. And uh, Smith and Nephew made me put this disclaimer in for the following slides. Um, BHR labeling includes the following patient education statements. Warn the patient of the possible adverse effect and limitation of artificial joint replacement devices and caution them to protect the joint replacements from unreasonable wear and activity, et cetera. So I'm gonna show you a few slides just to uh, show you, I think, what patients can accomplish with a BHR. And I would say the BHR is the only prosthetic implant that can make claims of returns to athletes to three major sports, NHL, seen here. This is a Florida Panthers player, number 55, who returned to a defenseman in uh, the NHL um, after about a year. And this is uh, Tiago Splitter, who uh, returned uh, after about 14 months to the NBA. Uh, he's number 47, he's the center for the uh, <clears throat> 76ers here. So very physical activities. And again, I think resurfacing is really what allows them to be able to do this. Um, <clears throat> and return to activity to an extreme is this wrestler here who say what you will about wrestling being a fake sport. These are really big guys doing really, really vigorous activity. And he's returned to his sport at eight months with his hip resurfacing. So once again, disclaimer is that not all patients will be able to accomplish this. And last year, I had the great joy of seeing my, one of my patients fence in the Olympics. 
and um, he's a Russian fencer, and he won the gold medal for his team. So um, I had to write a special statement that said the Birmingham hip resurfacing was not a performance enhancing device. <laughs> <clears throat> so for me, I think uh, the BHR takes a licking and keeps on ticking. It provides for me the complete armamentarium for the treatment of hip OA in a continuum of patients no matter how old they are. It allows my patients to be as active as they want to be without the risk of dislocation. It preserves bone, which benefits me and all other surgeons, I think, at the time of revision. And I still remember this case. I would rather revise a BHR than a total hip periprosthetic fracture any day. And this is a young active guy who had this hip done in his 40s. He was skiing, he ended up fracturing it. And I remember this case took me a really long time to put that together. Whereas with a resurfacing, if it were to fail traumatically, um, <clears throat> you could revise it fairly easily. <clears throat> so um, really the BHR over the last 20 years has uh, provided me the ability to take care of some of the most grateful active patients uh, that I've ever seen uh, because they are joyous in returning to their activity and they're super enthusiastic. So um, for that, I thank uh, Smith and Nephew and the BHR. And recently, I've been seeing the 10-year follow-ups, as you saw from the FDA study. So these are patients now with 10-year follow-ups. This guy was 49 at the time of his surgery, and um, now he's 59 and still doing great. <clears throat> this one, I think uh, I could have positioned the acetabulum better. He was 50 at the time of his BHR, but fortunately, uh, he's still doing well. And uh, if you look at his cobalt and chromium levels, he has a large enough size that even though it appears to be on the high side of inclination, his metal levels are still quite low. Uh, this is a patient <clears throat> that, um, again, he was young, 48 at the time of surgery. If I were to do this today, I would probably go bigger. So I would, I would probably, I was very conservative on the acetabulum uh, before, and I think I would probably go one size bigger. But uh, he's still doing very well uh, with his BHR 10 years out. This woman walked into my office. She's 10 years out. Um, <clears throat> Thankfully, she's still doing well with uh, very acceptable metal ion levels. And um, now she wants her other side done. So um, I think this is one that I'm going to have to turn down, unfortunately, for resurfacing. So future directions. Uh, now with 20-year results, BHR is one of the most successful hip implants available. So the question will, will rise, do we need to change? And uh, this, this was a clinical scenario that I thought um, answered the question for me. This is a woman who had a resurfacing that I did, and she got afraid of the metal and metal. She went to one of my colleagues, had this total hip replacement done, and uh, unfortunately, um, she dislocated that hip because she's used to the mobility and stability provided by the resurfacing. So unfortunately, she couldn't get, she couldn't get that, or she didn't want that resurfacing, and now without the sizes, they probably couldn't get it. So I do think the negative connotation of metal and metal still lingers. Women are excluded largely because of size. Alternative materials may open up resurfacing for women and those concerned about metal and metal. And maybe a hard on soft bearing will be the most forgiving for resurfacing. So in conclusion, I think hip resurfacing does have advantages over total hip in terms of bone preservation, stability, and a higher activity level. I think it's still alive and well um, in males with good bone quality and size, osteoarthritis under the age of 65. And there are a few surgeons performing it, but like everyone in this room, those who do it and are experienced with it are still strong advocates. So I'm happy to see you here. Thank you very much. <clears throat>